Hi, welcome into another edition of Ask the Experts. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Dave Callender. Back with me on the show today, I say without hyperbole, Canada's top real estate agent, Faisal Suziwala, is back with us from Remax Twin City Realty. Faisal, how are you? I'm great, David. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. Uh, and uh, I, I, I mean, you know, every time we talk to you, we learn something new. I'm going to ask a question, though, that I think I already know the answer to. Have you had a busy month? Very busy. Uh, our fall market has been extremely strong, probably one of the strongest that I've seen in the past few years. So that's a really good sign for our region, that's for sure. For folks who are just tuning in now, we want you to know that you can get a hold of Faisal by going online to homeshack.com. You'll find the office at 1400 Bishop Street in Cambridge, and you can call him at 519 624 5555. Why don't you start off by telling any new listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? So I'm a realtor in the region of Waterloo. I work with Remax. I actually just celebrated 32 years on November the 18th. So that was exciting. Uh, a long journey, but it's been a very rewarding journey. And I enjoy uh, what I do uh, representing the people of our region in purchasing and selling homes. And it is a journey that has led you through a, a lot of things right up to becoming a published author. Yes. So I want to mention that off the top as well, that your your book, The Real Deal, is still uh, very selling really well. It's on Amazon. Where else can people can get, get it? So we've got the website, uh, therealdealbook.ca. Uh, but of course, Amazon is the most popular site. And uh, the ebook is out. And the Audible version should be out any day now. So keep an eye out for that. All right. We certainly will. Uh, on the show today, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, assignments. Now, I, when when I was in school, especially in college, I didn't want to hear the word assignment. That meant I, I had an awful lot of work to do. But when we're talking about assignments in, in real estate, that's a totally different thing. And it can be a very desirable thing, especially if you have a condo that you've agreed to buy. But we'll get you to talk about it. You're the expert. Tell us, what what is an assignment? So essentially, an assignment is a transfer of interest in a real property to another party. And we're hearing a lot of this now, especially uh, when it comes to new construction, where you purchase a condo or a townhome or some sort of real property. And it doesn't have to be just brand new. It could be a resale, but you put in a clause which allows the original purchaser to assign that agreement to purchase and sale to a new buyer at a later date. Um, and typically it's for a profit. And that seems to be a, a, a huge trend that was always around in the condo community in Toronto, but we're seeing more and more of that in the region of Waterloo, Guelph uh, area as well uh, with a lot of the new developments that are coming up. <clears throat> So yeah, I've anytime I've heard the word assignment with real estate, it was always about condos, but it sounds like that doesn't have to be the case. Do assignments only happen with pre-construction condos or is it just most of the time? Uh, most of the time it's, it's new construction condos because what happens is a condominium building, for example, could be a year out before it's actually constructed and ready for occupancy. Now in that case, uh, what we've enjoyed in most of the real estate markets is appreciation within that year or two years. And in some cases, uh, a high rise in Toronto may be five years out before the actual uh, occupancy date. So hypothetically, you purchase a contract to purchase this uh, condo unit for, let's say, $500,000. By the time it's built, it may be worth $700,000. So what the buyer does is says, okay, Mr. Builder, I'd like the option to assign my contract if at the closing time, because it's four years out, my circumstances change. Maybe I'm making enough money that I don't want to uh, close on it and I'm going to assign my interest. Uh, but there's a lot of moving parts that have to occur. And I want to talk a little bit about that today. Okay, so we've talked mostly about condos then, but you can use it can an assignment can be for any kind of real estate, can't it? Yeah, and you know sometimes it's done with land purchases um, where let's say I see a, a parcel of land that I think is developable. I've got a few months to close. I buy it in a corporation, but then I decide I want to have a partnership or I want to 
possibly flip it to a another party. So I put in my original contract that I, as the original buyer, have the right to assign that contract to another corporation or another party. But again, there's a lot of legalities there. You know, you can assign what happens to your liability. What if, what if the next purchaser doesn't close on that deal? Does that fall back on you? So there's a lot of moving parts, as I said, and you know, legal counsel should always be taken in these matters, uh, especially when you're selling uh, and it's not a builder deal and you're a personal uh, homeowner or landowner that just wanting to sell your property and you see a clause come in, it's in trust or for assignment purposes, you really want to get some counsel on that and make sure that the original purchaser is not being relieved of their liability to close that transaction uh, if the second buyer doesn't actually close. Mm -hmm. what, what is your part in this as a real estate professional? What do you do when someone is going to assign something? So as a rule of thumb, I am not in favor of assignments and I'm not very popular amongst uh, builders and agents and, and buyers of assignment purchases. And the reason for that is I fear that a prospective buyer of a condo unit, let's just say, uh, we'll use Cambridge as an example. Uh, townhouse complex, uh, $550,000 purchase. We just did a deal. We sold 50 of the units out in a relatively short amount of time. Um, I would guess maybe 75, 80% of the buyers were saying, I'd like to buy that unit. I'm going to give you my 10% down, which is 50,000 or $55,000. But I want the right to assign this prior to closing. Closing is about a year out. Now, within this one year period of time, that buyer is anticipating that there will be appreciation of the property. But let's say there isn't. Do we know that that buyer, that original buyer was in the, in the position to close that transaction? They're counting on coming to month 10 or 11 and flipping it to a second buyer for a profit. But what if there isn't a gain in the, in the market? What if there is no second buyer? What if they need to close that transaction? A, what's going to happen to their deposit? B, is the builder allowing an assignment? If the builder's allowing an assignment, will there be a fee for the assignment? Sometimes the fee can be as little as $5,000, but it might be up to 5%. Now, marketing that assignment might be a problem because a lot of builders will say, hey, yeah, we'll let you assign your interest in this property, but you cannot put on MLS. We don't want to sell 50 units today and then have another 50 units, the same 50 units come back on the market one or two months before closing. Now you've got this surge of properties on the market and limitation on MLS, limitation on marketing. How are you going to actually resell that property? There are agents that specialize in assignment contracts, but you've got to be very careful. So my role, really, I don't recommend it, especially if you know you're not in a position to go through with that deal and close that deal. If you want security of knowing that, okay, I have the option of assigning it, great, but do it after you've confirmed with your financial institution that you will have funding in the event that you're unable to assign it to another party or if the market simply changes. Wouldn't, uh, you know, wouldn't that all be established up front though? Your, your, your ability to pay for the condo at the end? And there lies the problem. It's not. This is the problem that we are going to face. In fact, this is the problem that Toronto is facing right now where hundreds and thousands of units were purchased by prospective investors who were just lining up and booking condo units, some of them buying four or five units. Now, it's, I wouldn't say it's relatively easy, but it is relatively easy to come up with a 10% deposit just to secure your position in a purchase. What happens, uh, what about the financing? Do you have the 80% financing that's going to be required to close that transaction? Is that unit a year down the road going to appraise for the value? Is the bank going to lend on the original purchase price or are they going to lend on the new assigned price? More than likely, it's going to be on the original purchase price. So now the next buyer has to come up with the 20% down plus whatever difference there is in the profit that you're expecting. So a lot of these assignment purchases are purchased 
without bank approval. They simply had the 10% deposit. They put that forth. The builder's happy because the builder gets to run to the bank and tell, tells the bank, hey, I've got all my construction financing ready to go because I've sold out 60, you know, you see these signs that say uh, project sold out, 60% sold out or 70% sold out. Well, a lot of those transactions are not real in the sense that they're assignment deals. Those are intended to reflip at a later date. And again, these are things that a lot of builders don't want to talk about. A lot of agents don't want to talk about, but it's reality. And when that market isn't there a year from now, there's going to be this surge. And this is actually happening in Toronto as we speak right now, where units are coming to close and the original buyer doesn't have the funding. There, uh, with this whole de urbanization that's happening, we're seeing that um, there's no renters in Toronto. There's lots in our area, there's lots of demand in our area, and there's very little supply. And it's the opposite problem in areas like Toronto. So they're discounting rents, and they're, and in some cases, these assignments are now happening for less than the original purchase price because the original buyer is not in a position to close that transaction. And we don't mean something that's not homework. It's, you know, making profit off of selling your interest in a property, a lot of times a condo. And uh, before the break, Faisal, you were telling us some of the reasons why you're not a fan, but obviously there are a ton of people doing this. So other than just profit, why, why would someone want to assign a condo? Um, in, in a way, it's, a, it's, a backup. it's an insurance policy, let's call it, that, look, if you're purchasing a condo with the expectation that if it's a high rise, it'll be one, two, three, up to five years before it's going to be built, especially in markets such as Toronto, you don't know what your situation is going to be like in five years or three years from now. So you want the ability to be able to assign your contract so you're not on the hook to close that deal. Now, you are essentially on the hook, but you have the option to release yourself from that deal by bringing in another party to take over your contract. Most of the time that happens uh, for profit, but it also happens for job relocation or change of life circumstances. And it just needs to be assigned because of that purpose. So there's nothing wrong with asking to have an assignment clause, but always be prepared and know that you have the funding, speak to your bank, speak to your lawyer, and make sure that you have the ability to close that transaction. Um, now, there are reasons, there are more reasons why I caution against ha having an assignment. And number one is you don't know what the market's gonna be like a year from now. I'm optimistic in our region, I'm pessimistic in the Toronto market. I think that there's thousands of units that are going to come onto the market at the same time. And all of these assignments that have been um, uh, put under contract, I don't believe that most of those people or many of those people are in a position to actually close. So they've bought these units simply on the intent to flip. It's almost like I equated to the dot-com days where everybody was just buying bid.com or whatever stock was hot at the time, thinking it's just never going to end. And that's kind of the sentiment that we have in Toronto. We're seeing that you, you open up the newspapers in, in Toronto right now, and you're going to see headlines saying assignment deals falling through, uh, rental market declining. Why? Because there's a saturation. There's too many units. There's de-urbanization. People want out of the big cities. But the bigger implications that you could have here, number one, HST. If you're an investor, you are on the hook for the HST. What happens when you assign that? Is the new buyer going to have to pay the HST? Number two, capital gains. If you're doing this and you are purchasing it and, and, and selling it not immediately, okay, it could be capital gains. But if you do this on a regular basis, now it's income. So have you looked at the tax implications? So an accountant should be retained to talk about what are my tax implications going to be here? If I flip this unit for $50,000 more than I purchased it for, am I going to be paying income tax or capital gains? Is the next buyer on the hook for income tax or capital gains? Is HST going to be applicable to the next buyer, even if they're moving in? Or is it only applicable if they're an investor? Because you, as the original purchaser, was an investor. The other caveat here, which is very, very important, 
CRA has a mandate to audit assignments. Do you really want to be in their radar? I certainly wouldn't want to have that cloud over my head that I'm flipping, assigning, because all transactions have to be reported to the CRA. So now if they see this trend of assignments, chances are you're gonna get audited and the CRA actually has a mandate to audit assignment deals. So you're actually asking for a possible audit when you're engaging yourself in an assignment and nobody wants that. You know, I, I can't help thinking, I touched on it earlier, but I wanna come back to it. If I was a condo developer, why would I not ask for some kind of proof upfront that you can pay for this when closing comes? Are they just not allowed to ask? Well, they absolutely are allowed to ask. And in recent times, they're asking for a bank letter. But again, here's the problem. It's so loosey-goosey that a mortgage broker can give you a letter right now saying, David, you're qualified to buy a $1 million condo in Toronto at such and such a date. But the fine print says, subject to income verification, subject to credit check, subject to this, that, subject to cash down payment. Well, there's a lot of those subject to that haven't been confirmed. A letter from a mortgage broker often is just enough to satisfy the builder that you've got. Now that builder then takes that letter to their bank and says, hey, I've got all these units sold or under contract. Give me the funding to put the foundation in so that I can build this condo unit. There's a lot of boxes that are not checked when this type of transaction is happening. And we're going to see that moving forward. And that's why I really caution people with my buyers. I tell them, look, if you want an assignment clause, great but I want one of the big banks, one of the five chartered banks to give a letter with a firm approval stating that they have the ability to finance. Because the last thing I want is one of those 50 buyers that I just sold a condo unit to or a townhome unit to, to give me a call a month before closing and say, Faisal, we have, we're in no position to close this thing. We had the money to buy, we had the deposit money, but we don't have the, the funds to come up with the balance of the deposit, nor do we have bank approval because the subject to, I lost my job, I went through a divorce, I don't have, I, I was relocated, I don't have the funding to close this transaction, flip it for me. Then the builder says, fine print in their contract, you can't put on MLS, you cannot market it. How do you show that property? A builder transaction is very different than you and I trying to sell a property on our own. What can be negotiated in an assignment sale? Well, it's interesting. In, in, in one word, nothing. So when you are taking an assignment from the assignor, so you're the assignee, you are not at liberty to negotiate the terms of the original contract. So the original purchaser, whatever they agreed on, whatever they chose is exactly what you must assume. There is no negotiation. There's no going back to the builder and saying, I like this color granite, or I'd like to change the flooring. You're buying what the original purchaser had agreed upon with the builder. So you're very limited with what you can do after the fact. Okay. Now, when it comes to the builder, obviously, I understand that most builders do allow for assignments, but there's, there's always stipulations in there. What, a, what stipulations does a builder put on assignments? So the, the number one thing is they, they want a fee. So that fee may be 1% of the uh, purchase price. It may be 5%, it may be 5,000, maybe $10,000. It just depends on an individual builder. It depends on the amount of time. So if a project is going to be completed uh, within 365 days, maybe that fee is between five to $10,000. But if that project is four years out, that fee could be as high as 5% of the purchase price. So it's a significant amount that the builder is, because the builder is saying, well, hang on, we're building this for you. We want, we've got some skin in the game. We want some payback, payback if you're profiting on our project. So there's a little bit of, uh, now, of course, if it goes the other way, the builder's not in it for the, for the decline. The builder's still saying, pay me what you agreed to pay me. Absolutely. Uh, now, obviously, uh, you know, we've seen your face around town on buses. We're hearing you on the radio. Advertising and marketing is important for a successful realtor. 
So that's why I was so surprised when I, I was preparing for the show when I found out you can't market uh, an assignment. What, t give us the details on that. Yeah, so generally speaking, I, I probably get three or four calls a month from someone who bought a unit a year ago saying, Faisal, my closing is coming up in four weeks. I like to, I like you to help me assign my listing. I'd like you to, or, or my home, I want to sell it. Well, my first question is, do you have the keys? No. Can I have access to the unit? No. What is there for me to assign? The paper. That's the assignment, it's the paper. So I take the builder's plans, I take the legal offer that that purchaser had. Now I have to find buyers without marketing. So I need to now find a pool of buyers that are looking for assignment sales. It's such a difficult task in our region to do that. Now there are agents that specialize in assignments, typically condo buildings in Toronto. We don't quite have that environment in the region of Waterloo yet. Mind you, a lot of agents will promise, oh yeah, let's buy this unit, we'll assign it for you. But so many of those transactions haven't come to the assignment date yet. And that's where my fear is, is how do you sell something for a higher price? You do have to disclose to that next buyer what you paid for it, what your expected profit is, you have to tell them to go get tax advice, get accounting advice, get legal advice. When all of that comes together, does it still make sense, A, to do an assignment, and B, does it make sense for a prospective buyer to buy an assigned sale? Uh, and what kind of risk are they taking on? Because they're inheriting the original contract. They, the, assign, uh, the assignor gets his or her original deposit back which will mimic the original deposit. And then the profit is paid at closing. Now at closing, there are, there are two closings essentially. The lawyer is doing more work because there's an assignment, plus there's a closing um, and there may even be an occupancy. So the costs start going up, but I can't reiterate enough, get some tax advice on what the implications are going to be and lose sleep because CRA may call you. I, I'm still I'm still fascinated by this though. If you, if you are you say that there are realtors who are specialists in, in somehow getting the word out, when you can't do an MLS listing, what do they do? Just start calling people on the phone? So we're in a unique market right now where there's lack of inventory, right? There's there's very little supply. So buyers who are fed up with uh, bidding wars and losing six, seven, ten times every time they make an offer, they lose. Every time they make an offer, they lose. Look, I have buyers like that as well. So at, prospectively, I might say to one of those clients that keeps losing every time they make an offer, here's an opportunity for you to buy a property without a bidding war because the property is not being marketed. So forget getting a bidding war because there is no possibility of that when you don't have the ability to market that property. So it's really word of mouth. But when you have this massive supply that's just about to hit the market, which is what's happened in Toronto, there's not enough buyers for those assignments. So now there's the struggle. Are you gonna be able to fund it? Are you able to come up with a down payment? Are you able to close it? Are you able to pay the HST? All of those factors now come into play because there are not enough takers for those assignments. Now you have mentioned the CRA twice. And if that's not enough to make most Canadians nervous, I don't know what would. So let's talk a little bit more about the tax implications of a real estate assignment. What all is involved? Well, first and foremost, there's the HST aspect of it. Because when I buy an investment property, I'm subject to paying the HST portion of that. Now, I once I rent it out, I can claim that HST portion back. So I will get my HST back. But if I now sell it, or assign it to someone else, I'm still on the original contract. Now that new buyer either has to move in, or if they're saying they're moving in, but they don't move in, who is the government gonna come after? The original guy that bought it and said, I was buying it as an investment or the second party. So these are all things you're just, there's this web that's starting to get, get created here. The other tax implication here is, as an investor, you must report the earnings. So if I made a $50,000 profit on assigning my deal to you, David, 
I must pay tax on that. Now, if I do this on a regular basis, that's considered income. That's not considered capital gains. Capital gains is taxed at a lower rate than income is. So what's going to happen there? Are you going to try to slide it through as capital gains and take the risk that someone's going to come knocking on your door and say, no, sir, you've been doing this on a regular basis. This is a, a business for you, so pay us income tax on that. Um, so those are the tax implications. But what's more worrisome to me is when the CRA has a mandate to go after assignment sales, why open that can of worms in the first place? I don't know. I <laughs> like again, you're not selling me on the idea. You really aren't. Now you said obviously earlier that that uh, you know it can cost anywhere from five thousand up to five percent of the sale that you would give to the builder for an assignment fee. Are there any other costs involved in doing assignment of like a pre-construction condo? Well, yeah. So it's just the additional legal fees, and and so it's, it's the legal fees as an as a uh, as the assignor. If you retain an agent, you still have to pay that agent commission to find you a buyer. So there's still those fees. So when you when you look at all the factors, unless you're really getting a huge sum of money, um, you've got to think about on a five hundred thousand dollar purchase, whether the commission's four percent or five percent. There's twenty to twenty five thousand dollars gone there. Um, you're paying. Um, the capital gains or the income tax on that, you're paying double the legal fees because there's more moving parts now. So when you look at all of those factors and then you're taking on the risk of the taxation on it and whether or not you're even in a position to close that deal. So again, I'm just not, I've always said, if you're buying a property, buy and hold, don't buy to flip. I'm not a believer in flipping properties. I'm a believer in in buying properties, accumulating properties, building wealth over long term, and not in for the quick buck. And that's a safe way. And then you're actually getting capital gains when you sell those properties, or better yet, keep them forever and live off the rental income when you retire. Most people who have bought a house will be familiar with how closing a home works, but how does closing of an assignment work? Um, essentially, it's the same, but the first part is there's a contract assigning from me to you, now you're closing it, but there's an assignment. So the lawyer has to handle the transfer of funds, the transfer of the profit. So there's going to be a fee involved in that. Then the new purchaser pays the land transfer tax, pays the HST, pays the disbursements, the title insurance, and all the other stuff that goes along with purchasing a property still has to be paid. Uh, but there's just that one little step, which is, again, it's a costly step. There's a, there's involvement from a lawyer to be able to do that. A lot of these units have interim occupancy before the closing. So that means in a condo, you don't actually get your unit until it's, well, you get your unit today, but it's not registered for maybe six more months until the entire project has been completed. So while you're in interim occupancy, you're paying essentially a rent to the builder for that period of time. So you may be paying, you know, $1,300 a month or $1,500 a month for the next six months, again, comes off of your profit. So who's paying that? Are you paying it? Or is the assignee paying it? When is the closing? So these are all moving parts that someone needs to consider before they actually commit themselves to assigning or being the assignee. All right. Well, so let's assume that, you know, we, we actually do have the money to close the deal on our own. Why wouldn't we just do that and then resell the condo later? Why would you do an assignment versus resale? Which is, which is better? Most people doing the assignment, um, A, are looking for the, the, the quick profit or they've come to closing and realized they don't have the ability to close that transaction. The bank has declined them. Uh, they don't have the down payment um, or a life change has happened where they're just simply not in a position. So they need to exit. And we've been lucky over the last three to five years that prices have been going up. So exiting is fine. But when there's a, a massive amount of inventory in the marketplace, assigning is becoming more and more difficult. So... Um... I will probably continue this after the break then, but I just wanted to uh, 
to start touching on some of the the other downfalls that, that come along with doing assignments. And then maybe a little later on, we can talk about what's going on in the Toronto market versus uh, what's going on here in KW as well. What happens uh, if you can't find a buyer and you don't have the money to complete the sale and you're just sort of like, oops, sorry, what happens then? Well, you make the builders very happy, believe it or not. And that might be a shock to hear because remember, when you first entered into the contract, you gave a 10% deposit, say a year ago. Now, right now, the market has appreciated so much so that that builder is hoping, and I don't want to say all builders are hoping that, but the builder will be gladly keep your deposit and release you from the contract without any further liability because they have the ability to market it. They have the ability to throw it on MLS. They can call Faisal and say, hey, I just got this unit back. Can you sell it for $100,000 more than I sold it to this guy a year ago because he's in default. So again, and I have seen this exact scenario play out several times where someone just got in over their head, bought multiple units, was able to close on one, but couldn't close on the other two. On the final day of closing, I've been getting calls from people saying, hey, can you assign it for me? I've got four hours to come up with a down payment and a mortgage. Otherwise, the builder is going to take the unit back and resell it on me. And when the builder takes it back, they're making a huge profit because of the appreciation in the marketplace over the last year and a half to two years. And what do you say when you get that kind of phone call? Well, you know, first I'm saying, why are you calling me four hours before the closing? Um, you should have called me a couple of weeks ago because there are there are lenders out there, secondary lenders. Look, it, it starts getting expensive, but don't procrastinate if you know you're not going to be able to close on a transaction. Even if it means you got to go to a B lender or a private lender, you're better to pay a higher interest rate for one year and close the deal save your 10%, $50,000, $60,000. Don't lose that money because that interest rate over one year is not going to cost you fifty or $60,000. And you're still going to realize the appreciation. So do whatever you've got to do to try to close the deal. Don't simply walk away from it. But it's going to become more and more difficult uh, when there's too many units on the market. And if the bankers start tying... Uh, the restrictions down and not allowing people to finance because they've got multiple properties. They're all already limiting five properties per bank. You know, so you're getting in, into a lot of restrictions right now. And again, qualifying last minute is really tough. That's why get your ducks in a row ahead of time. And with any large purchase, the adage uh, buyer beware is always wise advice. So what is uh, what some of your advice? What are some of the red flags when you're considering purchasing a condo or doing an assignment that you should be watching for? So, you know, when you see a project, so one, two, three Main Street, there's 50 condos going up or townhomes going up. And if you see that there's 20 agents advertising the same project is showing up in your Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And every time you open, there's a new person advertising that project. That's a red flag. To me, that is an assignment type of project. So beware of that. Number two, if the builder is asking for an enormous deposit upfront, they're hedging their bets and saying, well, look, who cares if this guy doesn't close? Because I already got 15% or 20%. So if they default at the end, I'm okay because I've secured my uh, deposit money now. I'm able to get my funding to build that out. When you see now, and, and again, the consumer doesn't often see this, but I see this. When I see a project being uh, unveiled and they're offering me as an agent a ridiculous compensation package, you know, mass, like large commission, bonusing, like all of these incentives to the agent, when you're incentivizing the agent to bring people, probably it's not a great deal for the consumer. So this is where, you know, integrity has to come into play. And this is where you look at those projects that are 20 agents are offering the same project. Why do you think they're doing that? Because they're getting, getting compensated hugely by the developer, by the builder to bring that audience to that site and let's get their deposit money. Um, and again, it doesn't make me very popular amongst builders and agents that are doing assignments, but this is the truth and people need to understand 
Beware of assignments, get your facts, ask someone who really knows and really ask me because I'll, I'll tell you 90% of the time I'll talk you out of it because I don't believe that that's the right way to invest in real estate. Well, with about four minutes left in the show, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the situation in ter the Toronto market with all these thousands of units coming up. What, what are your projections for what's going on in Toronto? I'm very concerned for the Toronto condo market. There are going to be thousands of units coming onto the market, residential units coming onto the market. And then we have this phenomenon where we've got de-urbanization happening from Toronto. People are moving out of the cities, going into the suburbs. They want affordability, quality of life, and work at home has happened. And I, I promised myself I wouldn't talk about COVID, but I'm going to mention Due to COVID, this, you know, working from home has become immensely popular. What does that mean? You have office towers in Toronto that are vacant. No one's occupying these office towers right now because you can plug in and play and you can have internet, you can download, you have the cloud, you have everything at your fingertips on your sofa, on your laptop. You don't necessarily need to, to check in. In fact, I spoke to some large corporations who said that they are still as efficient as they were when people were checking into their offices on a daily basis. Look, I'm not taking away from the social aspect and the interaction, the collaboration that you get from that interaction. But as a rule, you can get the work done from home as long as you have Wi-Fi and internet and the computer. So what's going to happen to those large office towers? I'm pretty sure that we're going to see those being converted to residential units at some point. Now add more inventory to the condo market. I'm not a big fan of the Toronto condo market whatsoever. And I really feel that they better hold on because it's going to be an interesting ride. And for anyone that's engaged in assignments, better get out sooner than later. We've gotten so used to property values just going up and up and up and up. In Toronto, are you seeing that there's going to be price drops for these units? We're already seeing them drop. We're already seeing them drop. We're already seeing people retracting and already seeing people defaulting. Um, and I, in those cases, those builders are not too happy unless they really sold them at a lower rate and they can get more because there's going to be an influx of inventory. There already is. Look, when there's an influx of rental apartments available, even if you assign it to another investor, that investor is thinking, who is going to rent this unit from me? And at what rate? I haven't seen three months rent, free rent period. Like in our region, region of Waterloo, region of Wellington, we are getting bidding wars on rent. I asked $1,950 for a three bedroom townhouse. I'm getting offered $2,100. So what that's telling us, we're still insulated. So I'm not painting our region with the same brush as I am Toronto. But I fear for that market. And I fear for, for what's going to happen with all these buildings. They're going to have to convert them. You can't have all that real estate. Are, are we going to start see, seeing people from our region going back to Toronto then as the prices drop? Well, you know what? Interesting that you, you said that. There are people that really miss that Toronto lifestyle. Of course, Things are closed right now. And look, this may all be temporary. And when I say temporary, maybe three to five years before that recovery happens. But it, it will open opportunities for investors. It will open opportunities for those people who really love that Toronto lifestyle and just couldn't afford to buy in Toronto, came out to Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, or Guelph. Now they're going to say, well, you know what? If I've done really well in this region and we're thriving in our region, so let's take some of this profits and let's put it into the Toronto market. But I think it's too soon. I wouldn't be in a rush to go and buy in Toronto right now. Okay. As usual, we learned an awful lot this hour, Faisal. And if we still want to learn more, uh, we can give you a call, 519-624-5555. Or I guess we could purchase your book now, couldn't we? Yes, I'm going to get a shameless plug here. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> the real deal is on sale at uh, Amazon, of course. Uh, you can pick up your copy. And uh, we want to thank you once again for being on the show with us. Thank you very much for having me, David. Again, if you'd like to learn more about Faisal Zuziwala and Remax Twin City Realty, just go online and uh, type in homeshack.com. Thanks for listening. Hope you're going to join us again next Saturday at noon for more of Ask the Experts here on 570 News.